I remember. Everybody has a different recollection too, because we all met each other at different times too. You know, I remember meeting Ty and I remember meeting Jerry, and I didn't even know that they had even met each other. And yeah. you know, um, where were you? Well, we. I had moved to Houston. Uh, Houston. I had moved to to Springfield, Missouri, to join a band, and Jerry was so happened to be joining the same band, and that's how we met. Um, through that, I saw Ty playing at a. A spring fling at the, the the college, and he just got up and played this one lead. I didn't hear any guitar through the whole song until it went, went to the lead. I don't even know what the song was. Ty did a lead, and it was it was a typical Ty Tabor lead, and I was like, "This is really good." <laughs> and I go, "That's the guitar player. Who is he?" And nobody knew. And finally, I asked a bunch of people, and actually, a friend of mine that I was hanging with actually did some research and found out who. He was, and he says, his name's Ty Tabor. Then I went over to Jerry's house that night, actually, and I told him, and and his wife looked his name up in the dictionary. Yeah, I mean, not the dictionary, <laughs> the dictionary. Ty Tabor, you know, <laughs> what does it say about that? You know, that? I am pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, picked, she found his name in uh, 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 the directory, the college directory, and she called him up, and then she handed the phone to me, because I was real shy, I didn't even want to, I was afraid to call, you know. And she dialed the phone in here. You know, she just, so it's all her fault. So she yeah, better she not complain about this. <laughs> was at a Phil Keggy show, and um, I was playing for a band called the Tracy's Inn Band, and the, Tracy's drummer had just quit the week before the gig, and it was a really big gig for us, because it was like, you know, 10 bands in this uh, this gymnasium. Name but up on that, doesn't it? <laughs> Doug and Jerry were playing with, with uh, Phil Keggy, and that was the headline gig, and we played right before, right before you guys. Was it? Yep. Yeah, uh, I had no drums, and we had, and our also our band had no drummer, and they asked me to play drums, and um, I had never even practiced drums with them on this stuff. And I said, well, I'll try. So the way I met Jerry was I went up to him while he was setting up his drums and said, hey, I, I play in the band that's going to be playing right before you guys. Do you mind if I use your drums? It's sort of like, excuse me. <laughs> uh, could, I, could I use your drums tonight? Yeah. <laughs> I think the first time I ever played with, with Ty was uh, in the Tracy's in band. Yeah, in the we studio. Were a, we were doing a demo over right. at Greg's church. Right. I remember Ty sitting over in the corner, just playing this, these leads, just playing guitar. I'm going, man, that guy can play the guitar. I, mean, I like what he's doing. <laughs> and he was <laughs> 19, unusual, 18 years old. Unusual at that time. <laughs> Jerry ended up joining the Tracy's in band, and we did gigs together for months. At the same time, Doug and Jerry were still doing some stuff with Keggy here and there. I mean, we crossed paths with each other. I was playing with Jerry, and Jerry was playing with Doug, and then me and Doug were playing together. But none of us all three at the same time. Matter of fact, me and Jerry played for another thing, Greg Vole's band, yes. too, for, and we did a, We sure did. Well, I was stuff. out with Carl Henshaw's band. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Singing My Scarotum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> I really did that, didn't I? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what scrotum meant. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of sheltered, okay? I listen to music, that's about it. But uh, we were on stage, man, and I was doing a, we were doing a sound check, and I was doing a mic check, and I kept going, my scrotum. And it was this Christian college. And, and it, was like, it was like the lunch room, too, and these people were eating and stuff, you know? And, and I'm just over and over and over again. I mean, I sang it like a whole lot, and uh, and nobody said anything to me. But that was Carl. Though. <laughs> Carl, Carl loved to do that. Carl got a kick out of watching form. me make a fool out of myself. <laughs> yeah. Carl, Carl was our first sound man, and yes. he honed the PA. Mm -hmm. So everywhere we played, everybody thought we were the Carl Henshaw, Henshaw band. band because all our <laughs> equipment said Carl Henshaw on it. I 
I remember saying to you, Ty, would you like to play together? And at, I remember when I asked you, Jerry and I had already made a commitment to stick together. I mean, I remember we verbally talked about that before we even met you, right when Phil left. And I said, we're going to stick together. And Jerry said, yeah. Because I figured I found, I found a drummer. You know, this is cool now. We need this guitar player. Doug was the instigator of actually the bright idea of calling all of us and saying, hey, why don't we all play together yeah. <laughs> in the same band? Somehow we all ended up living in the same house except for Jerry and his wife and kid had you only had one boy then, right? Yeah, Jeremy. just Jeremy at the time. And um, they had their own place, but the rest of us and the crew and everybody working with us, plus friends and everything <laughs> else we could pile into a house, lived in Doug's house, a two-bedroom house, <laughs> and yes, sleeping sir. on the floors and stuff. There was a lot of us there. Like we, jumping, we yeah. lived in the ships <laughs> because, like, Ty and... Yeah. And well, there was like four people would stay up all night watching TV and just having a great time and sleep all day. And then the other four or five of us would sleep all night and get up all day and it was always a conflict. One thing though I think we all wanted to be is real melodic and real heavy which is something that there wasn't too many bands doing. Cheap Trick was like that, kind of. But uh, we wanted that heavy melody kind of thing happening. You know? So we've been trying to do that ever since. <laughs> as soon as we became officially a band, everybody had friends. Who wanted to be roadies and hang out mm. and by the way who all was in the band originally okay originally there was Dan McCollum and Ty and Jerry and me first the first phase of it and, and then Dan played guitar we had two guitars in the early days yeah Dan quit after the first gig remember <laughs> the the uh, the famous Twilight Zone show I still have that on tape you too yes sir that was a good show drum boogie oh man I love listening it was a club, a little club called the Twilight Zone. It's probably yeah. as big as, wasn't even as big as somebody's garage, one car. The guy had the bright idea to start having some, like, garage bands come play. Mm -hmm. Only place we could possibly get a gig, because they would take anybody, because yeah. they just needed a band. <laughs> Basically, after Dan left, um, we wanted to have another guitar player. We liked having... You wanted to have another yeah, guitar player. Yeah, I wanted to have another guitar player. I liked being in a band with, um, with four people. <laughs> I remember that. Instead of three, because it was just fun to me. I had always been in bands with other guitar players where you could play separate parts uh, yeah. together and, you know, and play off of each other. Right. And I, you know, I felt totally intimidated by the idea of being three-piece. So... I suggested a friend of mine from Mississippi I'd gone to high school with, a guy named Kirk Henderson. And I called Kirk and, you know, he packed his bags, came out to Missouri and joined a band. Immediately. <laughs> it's just like, okay, I'll leave home and forsake all and join this, <laughs> this nothing band. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> We were called The Edge, and uh, Kurt played with us, and, and we did a few more Twilight Zone gigs, and we got a few more, like, really crap gigs like that in a few places, you know, yeah. and started getting a reputation. Um, we started out doing all originals. Um, Twilight Zone, just total originals, mm -hmm. and some really bizarre ones at that.
This one place was Little Rock, Arkansas. It was the best gig we had. A place called the Wine Cellar. I say the best gig, it was the best paying gig yeah. we had. It was the most hellish nightmare six gig we sets. ever had. Was it six sets? It was five or six sets, but like till four or five in the morning. And I mean, hellish gig because even if nobody was in the place, and a lot of times that was the deal, nobody was in the place, we had to keep playing. The bar owner said, you play your sets regardless in case somebody comes in. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time we played, and literally Steve and Carl, who we were talking about, Steve, our manager, and Carl, our sound man, they even got up and left <laughs> while we were playing. And at one point, even the person behind the bar, because nobody's in the place, including our own crew, left. And we're sitting there playing, and I look around, and there is literally not a single human being in sight in this place, and we're doing our gig. And, uh, yeah, I remember one time at the same place in Little Rock, there were, uh, I think, two couples came in. There was four people in the whole place. We were up doing our, doing our gig. And the next thing I know, th those four people are just slamming each other as hard as they can. Just punch the guys punching the girls in the face, bottles being broke on their heads. <laughs> so this girl turned around Whoa. with his fist and just punched the guys. Bam! You know? Yeah. I mean, literally, somebody got a picture and went whack against somebody's face, cut it all the way open. Um, we Four still played. The club. Just we, playing. we kept on playing. I don't want to be from rock and roll. Maybe we should wait. For the bird? Yeah. Oh, I think it's cute. I don't know if we'll be able to hear him. Oh. He's far away. He's loud. Yeah. Hey! And then eventually Kurt quit. Also, just he just never really, uh, I think he always felt a little out of place in the band. He told me, he said, you guys are a three-piece band. You've always been that way. He said, you guys connect. And he says, I just don't feel a part of it. gig to do at the hangar, this club called The Hangar in Springfield. And so we rehearsed, you know, we worked, we got a whole new set. And we know. had been pretty popular there as the Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, we were pretty popular. And we went down to play the gig three-piece. And we were doing all these new songs that we weren't familiar with or weren't used to. And we were real nervous. And I'll never forget the feeling on the stage. It was like being in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> And then we did we did the show. I, I I was even singing lyrics that were so wrong in certain songs that it was like <laughs> almost heresy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, somewhere in, during the night, we decided to unveil our new name, you know. Whoa. And so we made a big deal. Of, we got a new name. We're not called the Edge anymore. But blah blah blah. And Jerry did a big drum roll, you know. All right. And all our friends and fans were sitting out there. And I said, we're called, drum roll, sneak preview. And everybody just went. No clapping, no smiling, just like. Oh, no. I remember we finished that set, finished our first set, and I walked off the stage to talk to our friends who had been with us throughout the edge and yeah. loved us and all that. And I sat down with these people, and one of the guys looked at me and said, I really feel for you guys. <laughs> <laughs>
I didn't lose any fans by just changing names, did you? I mean, I they still did. followed you, didn't they? You had I, think a we, yeah. oh, I think we lost a everybody. Lot of just about. Because yeah. everything was different. We weren't yeah. the we weren't the band that those people had grew up to to remember. You know, we had drastically made a change. We really did. Basically, sneak preview existed yeah. for a few years, and even by the end of it, it had it, sneak preview. The last few gigs we did, I remember we played sports club in in Springfield, and we were packing the place out again. We had actually gotten yeah. ourselves back yeah. up to packing places out again, like the Edge had done. Mm -hmm. um, and right at that time, we left town. We 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 moved. Tonight we would like to. Dedicate this last set to Springfield and all you people that come out to, to see us. And all our friends, because we're moving to Houston, Texas in about two weeks. We're not going to see you for a long time. So we want to say it has been a great five years of living in Springfield and getting to know everybody. So we moved to Houston to work with this record company in Houston uh, that had an artist. And for a trade-off, they wanted us to work with this artist and help him tour a little bit and record an album. And in return, they were going to do some demos with us and help try to shop us a deal. And so we moved to Houston, you know, with big hopes and everything for that reason. Things didn't, really things didn't work out, and here we were in Houston and, and didn't have money to move anywhere else, for one thing, so we just, you know, we said, hey, you know, we're not from any one place really anyway, so I mean, we're all from different states, you know, individually. So we made Houston our home at that point, and that was 1985. Right around the time we were working for this other guy, Ty wrote a song called Pleiades. Mm. And I think... As far as I'm concerned, that's what changed the whole direction and the whole vibe of King's Axe. Ty took the E string and tuned it down to D and played this sort of grungy, Beatle-ish kind of tune. And uh, it was real retro sounding, but yet it had all this, this psychedelic and it was, it was everything I was looking for. I mean, because at that point, I, I was just so sick of everything that was being played on the radio and stuff. And Ty had written that song for himself, not for us. And uh, he played that song. Well, he gave. We were on a plane getting ready to fly somewhere, and he handed the tape to both of us and said, "Listen to this song. You might like it." He didn't think we would, and it blew our minds. And as far as I'm concerned, that's that's when when we kicked into gear. And then we met Sam Taylor, and we started to hone in on this new sound that that we were hearing and putting together. As we started working on this newer stuff, this newer music, um, that was really different for us, but really what we wanted to play. We, we also wanted to change the name of the band again. And we really hated the name Sneak Preview. It just you know, it was a bad name. So our manager at the time suggested King's X. And it didn't really make us think of any one particular type of music. 
which was the, the thing we liked most about it. But we were still trying to come up with other possibilities for names, and you know, I don't even remember what we came up with, but King's X seemed to be the only name that stuck around. And after about a month or two, it seems, of uh, not knowing what the name of the band was, I remember we were in rehearsal one day and I just looked at everybody and said, so are we King's X or not? And uh, everybody just kind of looked at each other and said, I guess so. Well, I had a roommate who was moving away. He just kind of graduated from truck driving school and he was moving to uh, Memphis. Memphis. And um, he asked me if, if I would make him a copy of all of our demos. He just wanted to have something to, re to remind him of as well. He's driving on the road and stuff. Yeah. So I gave him a copy of the old stuff and against the wishes of the band, basically, I, I gave him a copy of the new stuff. And, uh, and um, he took it to Memphis and um, ran into a friend of ours, a drummer named Greg Morrow. He listened to the tape and he said he didn't like anything but the, the new four songs. And he called me up and said, man, I love this stuff. He says, what you been doing with it? And so I told him we sent it out and we got rejected and all that kind of stuff. And he said, well, there's one company, he knows these people, Johnny and Marsha Zazulo at Megaforce. He gave me the address and said, send a tape to them. So at that point, I realized that I had to go to Sam in the band and say, I, I did a bad thing here, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know let's go out. for it. So Sam took the ball and, and, and took the tape, packaged it up, sent it to, t sent it to uh, Megaforce. Marcia Zazula at Megaforce got the tape, and she has a friend named Sam Taylor, and uh, she thought it was her friend Sam Taylor, not Sam Taylor from Texas. So she immediately opens it. She never would have opened it before that. I mean, because they get, they get tons and tons of tapes all the time. So she opened it and she played it with an open mind saying, this, you know. And so she played it and she loved it. And she played it for her husband. According to what she told me, she played it for her husband and they both loved it too. But Marsha was the one, I think, that really loved us. Johnny likes, liked us, but Marsha yeah. was the one. And so they invited us to come out to New York to play a club called a Cat Club. It's this cool club where just about everybody played in, in, in New York at one time or another. We went out, went down there and... Played with Black Oak, Arkansas. Yes, sir. Whoa. Opened for him. Yeah. Jim Dandy himself. Jim Dandy to the yeah. rescue. And um, so we played and everybody seemed to love us. And that mm. night, uh, Johnny Sazula from Megaforce Records uh, said, uh, basically told us, you're not leaving town until you sign a contract. Mm. And that was, that was the... Uh, beginning of King's X getting a deal and making records. And there's a whole lot of in between. Whole lot of stories starting from album one to now. You know, but that's for another tape I guess. You like playing? People always say that to us. It's something between the three of us, so, but yeah. the other person's always kinda Yeah. You know. Important anybody that's ever really worked with us usually in some Form of fashion always moves on because <laughs> yeah. we are the dominant ones. <laughs> are you all that tight with each other and just, you know, just feel good with each other now? And but there's just something between us yeah. that that's a, that magic that uh, that you don't find in very often. When you find it, you keep it, you know.